about 50% of our species is male, born male, and about 50% of our species is born female. Uh, that, that's the population base rate. When you look at who gets killed by the cops, it is um, you know, roughly 90%, maybe even more, male. Now, on its face, you could yeah. ask, what the hell is up with that? Doesn't that prove that the cops are targeting men? Uh, that there's a bias on the part of the cops? Well, the reason no one talks about that is because, is because we all have a deep and intuitive and, in, in, and instinctive understanding that men are much more likely to be violent than women. We all know this, um, and only a very small segment of highly overeducated people would even deny that there's some some like something innate <laughs> about this. Men are more likely to be criminals exactly. when when the operator gets a nine one one call saying somebody is a danger to those around them. Almost always, it's a man. So, so the police yeah. are encountering men much more often. Even if they treat men and women precisely the same, they are going to end up arresting, shooting, being shot by a lot more men than women. So, so people understand that the right base, the right benchmark, is not the U.S. Census in the case of men and women. But that that observation holds true across the board, right? The the police are not you know, knocking on doors randomly, like it's not, it's not like jury duty where it should be distributed randomly. It, they, they're responding to 911 calls. Exactly. That is, that is one possible benchmark. As you say, another, perhaps even better benchmark is who is successfully shooting and killing cops, because that, that may be a, may, may be the best proxy for how often a cop might reasonably need to use his or her gun. So when you look at those benchmarks, the, the whole conversation changes. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think, I mean, it shouldn't be surprising to people that, um, I mean, in a sense, like, yes, we all have this, you know, I think almost biological understanding that men are more dangerous. Uh, we're literally larger, um, probably from an evolutionary perspective, probably in large part to be more dangerous so we can go out and wage war. Um, and our personalities are more aggressive on average than women. So I think that that's, you know, you're right that there's like, there is something that's fundamentally more understandable about that and, um, uh, than racial differences. But that at the same time, it shouldn't be surprising to anyone that there would be racial differences because the, you know, the whole, the, like the, the whole premise of the Black Lives Matter movement is in a sense based on the fact that, that Blacks have been disadvantaged in our society through slavery and Jim Crow and then subsequent uh, you know, destructive policies. And that has a profound socioeconomic effect. And you know, crime rates are strongly related to those, um, to you know, socioeconomic status, right? Uh, like if you look at a city like Boston, I mean, I, I haven't looked around in other cities, but I was recently looking to looking at all the faces of the people murdered in Boston, and they're almost all you know, hardly any whites, right? There's like one or two white faces. Um, they're almost all black victims of murders, and there's very little interracial murder. Like most, the vast majority of People, black people who are murdered are murdered by black people and the same for white people. And uh, I, I would assume for, you know, other races as well. I haven't looked into that, but so, you know, this, I, the, it shouldn't be surprised. It shouldn't be as surprising as it is to people uh, given that their whole, like the whole movement, their whole is about sort of addressing these racial inequalities that these racial inequalities have had impacts on violent crime. But anyways, um, the other way in which my background assumptions have been really overturned in life is by reading a lot of Thomas Sowell. Um, and basically, I, I think a lot of people in our age are operating with this assumption that when you have different ethnic groups in a multi-ethnic society, what would be normal or standard is for, for them all to be, to have the identical distribution, uh, the identical, you know, to have the, you know, perfect census number of doctors and lawyers and incarcerated people and nurses. Um, I mean, this, th that is one of the most deeply flawed assumptions 
that you could possibly have uh, that 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 educated people regularly have. So like if you just completely don't think about black people and white people today, right? Just think about quote unquote white people, what we think of today as, as white people, people descended from Europe. If you go back a hundred years ago and you look at the, you know, just how different the, not only the crime statistics, but the occupational distribution of Irish versus Italians versus Polish immigrants versus immigrants from Sweden, you find massive disparities as the norm. And this is true I mean, this is true for yeah. every multi-ethnic society that's pretty much ever been studied ever since different ethnic groups started living amongst each other. So, so you know, the background assumption that there's something normal, there's something weird about disparity between groups, that's something that has to, that, that people have to sort of get over too. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Like, even you would basically never expect there not to be a disparity in any meaningfully separate group. It could be like a difference of, you know, it could be a different profession. You know, it could be a different like hobbies. You're going to find some disparities most likely in a, along a variety of different factors. The idea that we would ever find like no disparities, that's, that would be a, actually a very unusual what it would help, I mean, finding. What would have to be true for that to be true is we'd have to live in a monoculture. Right. Every group would have to have the exact same culture. And again, culture is another name for all of the mm -hmm. values and desires and aspirations and habits that you grow up with. So the example I use is as a as a right. black American, I, I grew up playing a lot of basketball and seeing basketball as a, a sort of culturally black sport, which it is. And then when you look at the NBA, it's three quarters black. Right. It's completely dominated by black people um, as opposed to soccer was not really. Uh, it was definitely around in, in my youth, but it was not something that black people played quite as much as we played basketball. And I think sure. as a result, you see far fewer black Americans um, at the at the upper echelon of soccer. And that's a matter of cultural choices. I mean, it's a little bit of a, you know, culture isn't quite a choice. You're born into a culture and you inherit the, the, those values and beliefs. But you know, like we're not, we're unsurprised to see disparities that align with different, you know, uh, different cultures. And that, that's actually what it is to live in a multicultural society is to, to expect those disparities and, and differences. And then you can have the attitude to celebrate them. You can have the attitude to hate them and want to close the borders. You can react to it however you want, but you can't deny the fact of cultural difference and the disparities that they inevitably lead to you know all, all around this is one of the most amazing sort of intellectual mistakes i also read thomas Sowell's, uh i think it was discrimination disparities or something i can't remember the name of the book now but um it was just such a perfect explication of this point and it's still it, it still amazes me that we have people saying basically any disparity is evidence of discrimination like like people who have a lot of sway and they're not just like laughed out of the room um that idea is just so deeply <laughs> wrong. It's just sort one of one of the things I, I do so, sometimes still is just look Google household income by ethnic group, and you will see, you know, the, yeah. the rather large difference today between Americans of French descent and Americans of Russian descent. Between you know Nigerian yeah. Americans earn much more money than Haitian Americans, right? You, you will just see disparity all the way down. Well, the, the funny thing about that is like, you look at how much uh, Asian Americans out earn, earn white Americans, and you're like, okay, well, if you believe that disparities are evidence of discrimination, are you saying that our entire society <laughs> is systematically racist against whites? Because that's, the, I mean, that seems to be what you have to be claiming if you're, if you're gonna point at every disparity and say, but obviously that's preposterous, right? America is not systematically, you know, racist against white people. The the, the informed right. response to that would be to say there has to be a criterion that distinguishes mere disparities from disparities caused by discrimination. And the way to do that would be to subject it to subject it to a kind of econometric analysis where you try to hold every relevant variable constant and 
if there's any disparity remaining, you can you can attribute that to racism. Can so can you talk about the research uh, that you've looked at, which has attempted to do that in the case of of uh, killings of Black Americans, White Americans, etc. Yeah, well, really, I was only able to find one study that attempted to do that, and that's Roland Fryer's study, coming out of Harvard. One of the top researchers in his field actually set out to prove that the Black Lives Matter movement's claims were true, and it's the only study that really controls for the circumstances of shootings. Um, and I think he coded something like 290 different variables for each shooting and then did an econometric analysis uh, to see when you can basically when you compare apples to apples, similar circumstances like um, is someone shooting at a police officer and they're returning fire or is someone grabbing a candy bar off, the, you know, a store shelf and running down. So like those are two radically different circumstances. Obviously, you need to treat them uh, differently. And control when you're control when you're comparing two different racial groups, uh, you need to make sure you're comparing similar circumstances. So that's the only I was actually unable to find any other study that did that. Um, and you know he, his result, he he was surprised, I think, shocked by the results, um, as he recounted uh, in a podcast with you that I was just listening to, <laughs> um, but. Uh, you know, and basically it found that there was no, there, that police were not more, you know, readily using lethal violence against um, black people. And in fact, if anything, there was a very slight, small uh, effect to the opposite way. They were using more lethal violence against white people, um, although it wasn't statistically significant. There was another point that I was, I thought would be. So, yeah, the, the. The other result, the, the, there were two big results in that paper. One was the, the what he called the most shocking result of his career, which was that there was no bias against black people in shootings, in fatal shootings or, or shootings in general. It just, th there was nothing to be found there. And if anything, there was perhaps a small bias to be found in the counterintuitive direction, that is to say, against white suspects. The other result in that paper is that controlling for similar circumstances, police were more likely to put their hands on a black suspect to rough up, to punch, or otherwise um, non-lethally harm a black suspect. Um, which is a, an interesting result. I mean, you would, at first glance, you would think that those two things would be linked, that either the police would both be biased against blacks in roughing up black suspects and shooting them or they wouldn't be biased in both but turning out to be biased in one and not the other um it it poses an interesting puzzle to which i have i mean i have theories about why i think that is true but um in your memo you didn't really put forth any any theories about why you think that may be true but i'm curious if you have any thoughts yeah, well, I, I mean, I thought Roland Fryer's explanation of that was not very convincing. So my understanding, and I'm curious if he still believes this because it, because it seems problematic to me, but my understanding is his interpretation of that was basically cops have this utility function for exhibiting racist behavior or something, and, but, they, but they're rational actors and they know if they all, go all the way and actually kill someone, um, that they'll end up in jail or fired or something. So they basically, they, they, um, they basically um, indulge in that racist behavior right up to that line. Um, but that doesn't really explain why, uh, why there would be a difference in between blacks and whites suddenly um, at that, at that line, presumably that's always a concern for police officers um, when they're, uh, using lethal force, um, that they're always worried, oh my, you know, if I do this wrong, uh, that they're going to be uh, consequences. And it does, he didn't really explain why they would have a different calculus for whites than blacks in that circumstance. The, the explanation. Oh, well, I think I, I, I actually think, oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, what's your explanation? Well, the explanation that makes more sense to me um, 
and I and I, I I don't know if there was a way that Roland Fryer's um, study controlled for this, but basically you have police officers who are not necessarily engage, who not necessarily um, indulging in racist you know proclivities, but rather they have I, I think there probably is a level of bias. Um, they have ex personal experience um, policing you know difficult neighborhoods. Um, and they want to prevent a situation from getting out of control. Um, police officers, the more force they use up front, I think they often believe that the less likely that a situation gets out of control, the more quickly they can get a suspect under control in handcuffs, uh, in a position where they're not able to move, like on the floor with, you know, with someone, you know, holding their arms or something like that on the ground. The, the less likely there is, less chance there is for the situation to spiral out of control. So my guess is that there may be there may be bias there in the sense of the prejudging situations, um, in part based on a suspect's skin color, or maybe just based on a neighborhood, maybe just based on um, other factors that might correlate with with racial factors like kinds of clothing that people are wearing and that kind of thing, things that uh, Roland Fryer wasn't necessarily able to control for, and um, that that's ultimately what's driving this. That's not to say that I'm sure that there's some racist police officers. I haven't, but I just don't think that that's what's driving that. I just don't see much evidence that that's what's driving that disparity. <laughs>